Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to the Shade Science and Communication, a Simplified Approach webinar. It's being presented by Dennis Urban, CDT, and DSG's very own Vice President of Education and Training. Dennis Urban brings 40 plus years of dental technology field experience, including lab management, technical training, sales and marketing, product development, and quality assurance. A seasoned dental lab manager by day, Dennis balances being an um, also balances being an eminent lecturer worldwide since 1985. And with that, I get to say, take it away, Dennis. All right, thank you, Jessica. And I uh, really appreciate the kind words there. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. I'm uh, really excited about this presentation. Um, we, have, we have a lot to cover tonight on shade uh, communication and science, a simplified approach. And we're gonna start with a lot of basic uh, uh, approaches to, to shade taking. And then we're going to go into some uh, new technology uh, later on in the presentation. But uh, today we have an information pack webinar. We really, really do. And you know, we live in a world preoccupied with aesthetics, and the patients is, is concerned more than ever with the quality of their smile. You know, and this includes aesthetic demands on maxillary anterior teeth. And a big factor of that superior aesthetic outcome is shade integrity. And dental professionals, including dentists and dental technicians, have their work cut out for them finding the perfect shade match for restorations. And it's more critical than ever before. So we're going to cover a lot of this information tonight. So uh, we're going to ask uh, polling questions in between. We're going to uh, you know, maybe get you your questions at the end of the uh, uh, webinar also. And uh, we're gonna, let's get started. So tonight we'll, we'll cover understanding color and perception, science and theory, shade taking techniques, and manual and electric shade taking. So let's talk about the science of color and shade selection. So I'm going to take you back to school for a little while here where I can get to some of the basics of, of, of color and shades and, and things like that. So we'll, we'll talk about the science behind that uh, in a minute. So uh, but let's look at um, uh, light and color. So let's understand color is light and light is color. Very, very simple, you know, but not simple when you're taking shades. A lot of shades that you choose from, and we're gonna look at the entire visible spectrum later on with shade taking. But if you look at the primary cause of remakes in, in dentistry, um, it's poor color match is uh, probably 30%. Open margins is 29%, then it goes down to open contacts, defective material and others. You know, and a lot of them, uh, the other ones that do impressions and things like that. But poor color match is one of the highest reasons for, uh, for uh, remakes. And either it's too bright, it's the wrong you, too dark, too opaque, and for other reasons too, just not getting the right shade uh, on the right on the, on the restorations that we're making. So you look at the different coloring aspects uh, when you're taking these shades, and you, uh, well, a single shade can look so different because of lighting, as you can see here. This is the same exact tooth in different lighting, but it looks like you know one is like a like a B1, and it goes all the way to, to maybe like an A3 color. So we want to make sure we have the correct lighting, and we'll talk about that in a little while. So what's one of the best color tools? Of course, it's our eye, you know, but we have to make sure we have the right surroundings when we're taking those shades and the tools uh, to take those shades. So can any, anyone define color? What is color? I'm gonna take it back. I'm not gonna take it too far back. We're gonna talk about uh, color and how visible light was uh, pretty much documented and the science behind it. Well, light is a phenomenon, phenomenon of light, of red or brown pink or gray, and a visual perception of that enables one to differentiate otherwise identical objects. In 1670, Sir Isaac Newton proved that white light is truly a mixture of all colored lights that travel in waves. And you all heard of Roy G. Viv with the rainbow, the different colors of the rainbow, and that's pretty much refracted light. And we'll talk about that, uh, specular reflection and those types of things in a little while when we talk about taking shades with natural teeth and also, also building up porcelain restorations. Light is color, like I mentioned. But what is necessary to see the color? Well, we need illumination, which is a light source, a sample or object to interact with the light energy, and a receiver or processor. So we, we go from the light in the dental office, uh, and then we have a shade guide, and then we have our eye. So all those things come together to, to take those shades, but we have to have the correct lighting. And most of the light and color we perceive is reflected and not direct. So the color we see is a portion of the visual, visible light spectrum and is not absorbed by an object but reflected back to our eye. And we'll talk about that visible light spectrum in a little while. And we'll talk about the traditional way of taking shades and the more scientific way of taking shades. This particular photo is a grass green. Well, all colors are available. 
and the color that is not absorbed is reflected and therefore we see that, that color. And the, the dominant wavelength of this color is green. And perception. Perception is light that reaches our eye when we view an object. And this, this has been changed by the object. You know, interaction with the light of that object allows the perception of color. No light, no color. So let's talk about perception for a second here. And um, it's real important because we see things differently. We all see things differently and especially under different lighting conditions. So let's take a look at this particular slide. You stare at it, it's kind of playing tricks on your eyes. You know, things are swirling around here and it's just, uh, and it looks like it's swirling around, but it's not, it's actually staying the same and, and it's, it's motionless. But things, that's just like when you're taking a shade, it plays tricks with your eyes sometimes if you stare too long. And are all the horizontal lines parallel or do they slope? Well, they're all parallel. And this particular slide here, this is an interesting one. If you look, is it the back? Is that a back wall or is it a column that they're showing? Uh, so that's kind of tricky. And if you look at these nuns walking here, the ones up front look like they're larger, but actually they're all the same size. So perception is 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 uh, is, is very very di different in different situations. So before we get to the terms and property of light, I'm going to I'm going to just pull up a polling question here. The first polling question, and it has to do with possible shade perception problems. So, Jessica, if you could bring that first question up. So, because of possible shade perception problems, do you send the patient to the dental laboratory for a shade, or do you take it yourself? So, because of possible shade perception problems, do you send the patient to the laboratory, or do you take the shade yourself? Wait a second here. All right. And the results for other stuff. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Especially now, you know, with the last year with COVID, it was kind of hard to send patients to the laboratory. So uh, we do take shades in the laboratory, uh, but, uh, you know, we'd like to just get a, a good reference point of who's doing what here. So, so let's look at the terms and properties of light. You know, we have a lot of different terms and properties, transparency, translucency, opacity, absor absorption, metamerism, reflection, reflect, refraction, gloss, fluorescence, and opalescence. And we take all these terms into consideration when we're in a laboratory building restorations, especially on interior restorations and with porcelain. Uh, so let's elaborate a little bit more on the terms and property of this light. So, just. so transparency is capable of transmitting light so objects can be seen as though there are no, no intervening material. It's something you can see right through it. And translucency, usually like an incisal edge of an anterior tooth, you can see it's a degree to which light is transmitted rather than absorbed or reflected. And high translucency gives a lighter appearance and high translucency in a more distal position gives a darker appearance. And opacity, the ability of an object to absorb light and the opposite of translucent and the light passes through the object, but it's deflected and frosted glass is opaque. And if you look at opacity, if you look like a posterior rest restoration that's monolithic, that's very op opaque and it has opacity. And absorption is uh, determined by the density and the makeup of the material that the light travels through. And this comes into uh, to play when we're building up porcelain or layering uh, different porcelain on different porcelains on different restorations to make things a little uh, look more natural. And metamerism is the appearance of a certain color variation depending on the light source. And the best light source is natural diffused light. You know, that's, uh, it's, it's very important. The worst light source is a harsh direct dental chair light. And reflection when a light strikes a solid object and bounces back like a mirror. So this is simple, simple science here, but we, I'd like to bring this about because a lot of these the different uh, variations come into play when taking a shade. And there's your refraction, like I mentioned before with the, the, uh, the rainbow. And gloss, a surface gloss is the optical property that produces a lustrous appearance, just like when we glaze a crown. A high surface gloss is associated with smooth surfaces, composite or porcelain. Surface gloss dec decreases with increasing surface roughness. So a high gloss lightens the color of the appearance. So uh, we get a lot of adjustments in the laboratory. When it comes back, we might have to put a higher gloss uh, on, on the rest restoration. So uh, in decreasing surface roughness. And fluorescence, it's the emission of light by an object that wavelengths differ from those of the incident light. And this is what makes teeth look natural. You want the fluorescence or opal opalescence in your, in your teeth to make it look natural. And natural teeth emit visible light when exposed to UV light. 
and opalescence. It's a, uh, and we talk about the Tyndale effect. You know, the Tyndale effect is you know, under direct light, the shorter wavelengths are reflected from the fine particles of natural dentin and porcelain, giving a bluish appearance and the longer wavelengths are absorbed. And in trans illumination, the longer wavelengths are reflected at the surface and the shorter wavelengths are absorbed, giving a reddish orange appearance. So let's go back to science and what you learned in school. Light is energy and it travels at straight lines at 186,282 miles per second. And I, I, I have all this in, in here for a reason, so uh, bear with me. And Einstein defined light as the discrete packets of bundles of energy called photons. Like TV or radio signals, light oscillates and can have many different, different uh, frequencies. And it's the frequency of light that creates a sensation of color. And all this is taken into consideration, even with the electronic shading systems that are out there today, which we'll elaborate more towards the uh, uh, middle and end of the seminar. And a light wave, it's a wave, wavelength, a frequency, and amplitude. It has all three of those properties. And light is energy in the form of a wave or a proton, a photon rather. So let's look at the visible light spectrum. Uh, in nanometers, the wavelength of visible light, which can be perceived by the human eye in nanometers. And, you know, to, to perceive these color wavelengths, we have color receptors like cones. You know, cones respond to three colors, red, green, and blue. And then we have light receptors or rods, and that responds to light or dark only, which is value. You know, so we have a light and dark only, which is value with the, our, our rods and the colors are, are our cones. So look at the rod response. Uh, let's go, let's go, to go back for a second. I'm gonna just show you. With the, look at the rod response with the cones here on, on the bottom. So seconds after the, the pulse, you start to lose that response. So that's why when you, when you stare at the shade too long, it, it kind of mixes you up and, and you don't have an accurate shade. But the rod response with the uh, value is more persistent and it has more of a latency period. So value lasts longer when you're taking a shade, when you're looking at a tooth, than does the color or cone response. So light source quality, let's talk about light source quality. It's a color content of the aluminum, luminant that interacts with the object being perceived, which is a tooth. And overhead fluorescent lights give off a reddish spectrum. So they're really not a quality light to use when you're taking a shade. You can use D50 illuminance or something that's closest to natural sunlight. And light conflicts in the laboratory in the operatory is light from the window, light from the hall, um, light from the color corrected tubes, dirt and dust on the tubes I mean, and lighting in the operatory. So let's, before we start talking about teeth, I'm just gonna pull up another polling question. I just wanna, just wanna ask this, you know, when taking shades in the operatory, do you have corrective lighting in place? I'd like to just know how many, how many uh, people here have corrective lighting in place, in place in, the, uh, in the operatory. When taking shades in the operatory, do you have corrective lighting in place? All right, let's see what that, uh, okay. So yeah, we need more corrective lighting. You know, unless you take the patient over to the window and get the correct lighting, you're gonna have some trouble with the shades. Unless you're using uh, something called a spectrophotometer, which is an electronic shade taking system, which you don't need light for. So I'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But let's talk about teeth. Oops. Go to the next slide here. So we talked about two terms before, specular reflection and diffuse reflection. So which specular reflect, reflection is light reflected from a surface and the diffuse reflection was light that penetrates an object and we reflected back. So these, this is very important when talking about shades. So the shape of the tooth defines where the reflection will be. So you see the shape of this anterior tooth here. You know, so we're looking at the incidental light diffuse reflection. Let me see if I can highlight this for you here. Uh, and then, yeah, diffuse reflection. Then you got uh, some translucency on the incisal here. But all this takes, you know, into, you take this all into consideration when you're taking a shade. And then when we're building up the porcelain. So if you look at that tooth on the right, we're trying to mimic natural dentition when we're building up porcelain, especially on anterior anterior restorations. So layering and creating various levels of opacity and mimicking tooth structure using base dentin, dentin, and enamel, as you can see right here. And this is when we, a good ceramics can create that natural effect on teeth, especially anterior teeth to make them look natural. And uh, so sometimes we have our, our you know, job cut out for us because many times it's more than one shade. So you're taking different shades on, on, on different, different parts of the tooth and uh, we'll follow your instructions on those different shades of building up porcelain and mimicking natural dentition. 
So let's talk about understanding and communication of color. One artist's solution was Albert Munsell. He was an artist and a teacher and a powerful and practical observer. And Munsell brought order to color and he developed the first numerical scheme with color. And he laid the foundations for color science. He really did across all industries. Let's talk about understanding color. So this is a sphere and we're gonna talk about the color sphere now. So with the color sphere, you know, we have, it's, it's a, it represents the entire universe of color. And it's scientifically known as a CIE or, or the LAB sphere and the LCA sphere. And it was created as an international standard of color representation. And this terminology is expressed in every, in every industry throughout the world defining color coordinates. And the sphere and globe contains over 10 million color, color variables within that may be recorded. That's, that's a lot of colors to, to uh, comprehend here. So when we talk, up, talk about um, you know, teat, it's a three, we talk about a three-dimensional model with three independent variables, uh, value, variables with value, chroma, and U. And you know, the, CE, the sphere, CIE sphere that has three axes. So the lightness or value of colors of, of brightness is the highest at the top. The brightness is the highest at the top and the darkness is, is at, on the bottom of the South Pole. And the two shades fall into a banana shaped area. And chroma is the color's richness and saturated, saturation and originates from the core to the outward edge, as you can see here in the sphere. So there's only a hundred variations where, which were visibly noticeable, which is pretty in, in, intense when you think about it, because we have all those thousands of uh, shades that we talked about, and there's only approximately a thousand measurable shades in dental. So imagine a thousand measurable dental, dental shades and you have all those other different variations of color. So it can be kind of difficult. So, uh, and, and the U uh, is the actual name of the color and rotates around the surface. So let's talk a little bit more about Munsell hue. You know, it's a specific wavelength. It's, it's a basic color of the shade. And the cones and the retina cell sense color, like I mentioned before, and it's concentrated within the central fovea. And it's an area of optimum visual acuity. Six million cones in number, and we have three types of cones. And the primary and secondary colors, we'll talk about primary colors, is perceived when one of the red, green, and blue wavelengths are absorbed. So we see red when green is, is absorbed and so forth. So, it's, uh, it's, it's, so those are the primary and secondary colors. And the secondary colors are formed by combining two of the primary colors, which is red and yellow equal orange. And speak about, I like to just mention about color blindness, the blindness and see lack of cones for color perception. And for instance, in males, it's eight to 12% of the population of males are colorblind. And females, it's only 5%, you know, and I like to bring up a story. I, I, used, I used to work with Vida years ago and uh, used to go to Germany uh, maybe once a year to see how they made their porcelains and denture teeth. And they made all the, pretty much all the denture teeth by hand at that time. And they had about 30 to 35 technicians and they were all female. And they're laying, they were in the, the different acrylics for the denture teeth just to match the shades exactly. And I, from one day I brought it up. I said, I said, I see all female technicians here. Uh, how come you don't have any male technicians? They said, well, uh, male technicians have more color blindness. So we hire only female technicians to, to make these denture teeth. And I thought that was pretty interesting. You know, so it's only 0.5% of the population that are colorblind when, when it comes to females. So, and, um, it's well, complete column blindness is very rare. So Munsell's chroma, the strength of a color or the distance from gray, candy, apple, red, chrome, yellow, or forest green. And it's the quality by which we distinguish, distinguish strong saturated colors from weak achromatic ones. And here's Munsell's chroma. You see this, the strength of the, uh, the, of the color. And that's how we get our chroma. And we'll talk about value, uh, U value and chroma when we start taking uh, using our 3D master shade guide in a little while. And the value is the lightness of color, like I mentioned before. It could be a, a, a gray or dark or white or a light green, light red or white, et cetera. It's a, white, a lighter color uh, to the darker color. So it's quality by which we, we distinguish, uh, distinguish shades from the lighter ones from the darker ones. And the value again is the amount of white in, in, in the shade. So, uh, and we have 120 million rods in the retina for the perception of value. And if you remember, remember before what I said earlier, uh, value uh, lasts longer with, uh, in, uh, when we look at value than, to, than when you look at color. So will you practice 1956 dentistry in 2020? I'd like to mention this because one of the earliest shade guys that was ever made 
was in 1956, and it was made by Vita. And uh, so if you look at the shade guide, this shade guide was, was actually made for denture teeth. And <clears throat> it was pretty much acc acclimated over to the standard um, Vita master shade guide, the re regular uh, shade guide that they have, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And But mainly it was used for denture teeth. But when it came to taking shades for porcelain restorations, we needed something more scientific. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So you have a lot of shade guys out on the market to choose from. You know, and many times we'll get shades in the laboratory to say, tell us to, to match a Vita shade, but you know, it's none of those shade guides that you see here match the Vita shades exactly. They're close, but they're not exact, but they try to mimic that. So pretty much our standard in the laboratory is using Vita shade guides, Vita classical and Vita 3D master. So we, we see things differently. And I like to show these two different slides here of how we see things differently, how we can make it easier to read. So I'm gonna read this first slide and then the second slide. The American Dental Association defines the term evidence-based dentistry as follows. Evidence-based dentistry or EBD is an approach to oral health care that requires the judicious integration of systematic assessments of clinically relevant scientific evidence relating to the patient's oral and medical condition and history with the dentist's clinical ex expertise and the patient's treatment needs and preferences. Now that's a mouthful. That's kind of hard to understand. But if you break it up into something like this, it's more easy, it's easier to look at and easy to read and easy to understand. So we break it up into sections and look how it, look, it looks now. And it's a systematic assessments. We break it up with clinically relevant scientific evidence relating to the patient's oral, oral and medical condition. So we try to do this when it comes to shade taking. And that's why we have a more scientific approach when you're taking shade take, uh, when you're taking shades now, especially with the 3D master system. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So color science and education. So we'll now look at shade taking a little bit differently for more from an evidence-based scientific standpoint. So we wanna understand the science of color, use an adapted tooth guide, employ a teachable system and utilize training tools. And some of the current shade systems on the market, I mentioned earlier about the Vita Classical Shade Guide. Well, that, is, that was the industry standard, standard from 1956. And you know, when I found out year, uh, years back that this was meant for denture teeth, and it was being utilized for taking shades on, uh, on uh, crowns and for some restorations, and that's when you know, not only me, but the people who invented the 3D Master Shade Guide said, you know, there's gotta be something more scientific because this shade guide was built on the value system rather than the value you, you and Chroma. So, and we'll talk about that in a minute. You know, it's classic and competitive, but it lacks uniformity. You know, it's a great shade guide, don't get me wrong. It's, it's great for taking basic shades, but we need something more detailed and there's no standardized method of use for measuring color. So let's look at the limitations of the color, color, uh, current shade systems out on the market. Color gaps, shades are not uniformly positioned throughout the tooth color space. I'm gonna show you that color space in a second here. And it's inaccurate interpolation, which means there's intervals between shades and they don't yield a single discernible intermediate shade. So, you know, many times in the laboratory, I would get, we would get shades like, uh, give me an A, uh, something between an A2 and an A3, you know, like an A2.5. So we used to get those a lot and try to make, make the shade a little bit darker than A1 and, or a, A2 and make it a little, a little lighter than A3. So it was kind of difficult, but now we have a good evidence-based shade system to, to utilize. And not that it wasn't systematic, the current shade system. The shades were not schematically organized to reflect the three color dimensions. So let's look at the current shade system right now. So if this is what you see here. This is the color shade system in the Toots colored space. This is that little banana shape I talked about. So, you know, the current shade system, shade system is located within the tooth color space, but notice that many of the shades are clustered together or are partially covering other shades. You know, such shades with these clusters have a similar value or lightness, but differing use, and that the eye may not easily distinguish. You know, so patient shades that are located between the above samples cannot reliably be matched consistently. So that's really important to look at. So there's your classical shade guide from A1 to D4, and it's from uh, the value based shade guide. And uh, here you are, there you have it. This is just that little banana shaped uh, sphere that I showed you that's gonna go in, into this color sphere from A1 to D4. It's overlapping areas of classical shades an area of potential mismatch. And the observer sees value more than they see of chroma or U. So we can break this up into value as you see here with the lighter to darker. And, uh, and, this, this, and you can really tell that it's a value based shade guide. 
There's a little example of her right here. So Vita, Vita Classical versus 3D. Well, let's compare the Vita Classical 16 shade guide to the equal color spacing of the 26 shade Vita 3D master system. From left to right, the 26 shade 3D master shades range from the brightest to the darkest with increasing richer colors to the right. So this is unlike the classical 16 shade guide, which is subjective and not scientific in this approach and does not separate the three dimensions of color, which is lightness, value, chroma, and hue. And black and white usually and value intuitive versus it's an intuitive arrangement versus a scientific arrangement, as we can see here. There's your intuitive arrangement to scientific arrangement. We're going from regular to value right here. So some, some subjective to systematic arrangement. We're gonna go through the process of this now. I remember when I first, these, uh, these shade guides first came out and I was going around to different dental offices and uh, giving them these shade guides and to work with them. And many times it would end up in the drawer because they, it, was, it was kind of complicated at first, but we're gonna go through a simple, a simple approach on how to do this. So, so it's subjective to systematic. So how does the 3D master system work? Well, first compare the brightness level using five groups, value groups. And we're only determining value. Uh, and it's from the lightness to dark. And we're not determining the actual shade at this point. And the brightness of the shade is arranged from left to right, becoming increasingly dark to the right. And next, we're going to choose the chroma. And in other words, how rich or saturated the shade is. And the chroma begins at the top of each group with the palest and less saturated colors and becomes deeper in color as we move down. And the third selection is a subtle variation from the yellowish to reddish shades and of the selected color known as a hue and which is shown in the middle three value groups only. And we'll break this up in a little while, I'll show you a little more detail. So these three determinants of value of, of color, value, U, and chroma, uh, chroma and U, give us a system name, the 3D master shade system. So it's an orderly and equidistant uh, shade, which means they have equal distance from each other, they're not, they're not bunched up like they are with the uh, classic shade guide. And you know, consider the 3D master shade guide overlaid with the same color space. It differs numerically and with spacing with the zero being the highest value through the number five and the lowest uh, darker, uh, is, is its lowest darker shade value. So uh, the overall shade coverage is near double of that the of the classical. And now we can confidently uh, you know, achieve the new in-between shades like I mentioned before. So it's hard to achieve shades that we had earlier with the regular classic shade guides, but consider the classical A to D graphic to the right which clearly displays a subjective chaos of A to three shades without order. Okay, so now we have the 26 shades spaced uniformly to cover natural teeth shades throughout the color space, as you can see here in that color sphere. And it's 26 shades and it's a systematic approach which allows for the exact shade choice with the accurate intermediate shades that can be created with continuity. So, at this point, I want to ask another uh, polling question. I just like to get an idea of what kind of shade guide you're using before we move on. So we'll pull up the uh, next polling question now. Do you utilize the Vita Classical Shade Guide or the Vita 3D Master Shade Guide or both? Again, do you utilize the Vita Classical Shade Guide or the 3D Master Shade Guide or both? Let's get an idea. Yes. All right. So both, okay, great. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I see a lot of clinicians using you know, certain shade guides like the classic shade guide for simple restorations, even posterior restorations and on anterior using the 3D shade guide. All righty, so 17%, this is a study that was done and 17% 17 of the shades measured, measured with conventional shade guides needed required correction before placement. And 99% of the shades measured with the 3D master shade guide needed no further correction, which is pretty interesting. I mean, that's, that's a pretty good uh, track record right there. So what influences us? What are the basics and what do we need? So let's talk about actual shade taking now. I gave you some of the science behind it. I know sometimes it's boring going through the science, but I like to, you know, we always, I always go back to the basics on any one of my webinars or seminars because it, without the basics, we're not going to get success, you know, with any restoration we're doing. So whether it be crown or bridge, dentures, or even shade taking. So let's look at what influences us, what are the basics, and what do we need? So some of the contrasts we have to look at, you know, the U contrast, the chroma contrast, and the value contrast, which we mentioned earlier. Look at this restoration in different lights. 
lighting situations. It looked like they look like different restorations. They were all the same one with different lighting conditions. It's pretty amazing, huh? That's why it's so important to have the corrective light. And there's a before and after photo. So let's look at look at the operator influence or color deficiency. You know, some people have trouble seeing red. And we talked about color blindness before, the absence of photosensitive pigment pigments. We have to take that into consideration because a lot of people are colorblind, you know, and uh, you know, I know many people, even technicians that I know are colorblind and they're not taking shades in the laboratory. So, uh, and you know how diff difficult it is to take an accurate shade at times. But one in 13 males are color deficient and one in 300 females are color deficient. If you can see the number eight in the middle there, then you're in good shape. All right, so uh, let's go to the next slide. And if you can see the number 45 here, you're not colorblind. So that's some good news for a lot of people. <laughs> So let's look, look at the operator influence. Let's look at age. You know, with time, the cornea yellows and it imparts a yellowish brown bias. So a lot of older uh, people who are taking shades, they get like a yellowish hue uh, when they're taking the shade. And they have trouble seeing, uh, you know, white versus yellow. And it only starts, I shouldn't say old, but it starts after 30 years old. It's noticeable after 50 and clinically significant after 60 years old. And then we have opt operator fatigue influence. You know, color cannot be perceived actually uh, accurately by tired eyes. You know, so uh, we need to be alert and not have tired eyes to take a good a good shade, an accurate shade. Color may appear to be faded or blurry, and it can lead to an inaccurate match. And op operator influence emotions. This is a, a fact too. Emotions affect pupillary diameter, and it has an absolute effect on color perception. So just make sure you're in a good mood when you're taking a shade. Okay, that might help, but uh, and it does have an effect on your uh, perception, color perception with the pupillary diameter of the eye. And other uh, medications, we talk about different medications, caffeine and different medications, even oral contraceptives, it, it just gives you different color variations in the eye that you see more blue or red, red and orange. So you want to be, be careful of medications that you're taking also. This does have an influence on taking a shade. And binocular influence. When two identical objects are placed side by side, it can appear different. And placing a shade tab above or below the tooth on either side, like this, the shade appears to be very different between these two identical A1 shade tabs when compared side by side in maxillar and mandibular position. So you wanna make sure you have it in the right position when you're taking the shade, or else you can get, get fooled. And what about bleaching? You know, people want, you know, people want their teeth to bleach, you know, and a lot of bleaching teeth measure out the high values of very low chroma, you know, and the intrinsic color pigments are removed and the teeth become very white and highly translucent and color saturation of chroma is greatly reduced. So, you know, if the patient is considering or in the process of bleaching, do not attempt to predict the final shade at this point. This is a guaranteed remake, yeah, definitely. So uh, if the patient is bleaching at home, Advise them to stop when their teeth match the whites of their eyes because therefore maintaining an aesthetic balance with their face because you can go too white. You know, I, I, I laugh sometimes when I get a, a prescription in the laboratory where we have a, a 80 or 90 year old patient wanting uh, an OM1 denture tooth and the dentures, you know, the, the teeth are going to walk into the room before they do. But, you know, whatever they want, we get them, you know, but uh, sometimes it just doesn't look natural, you know. So, uh, and if the patient has completed the bleaching process, do not take the shade until about a week after the bleaching application because it's common for a slight bounce back to occur immediately after bleaching is finished. So uh, really important to look at. And this is the 3D, this uh, a rather bleaching shade guide that's available on the market that you can measure the shade when you're bleaching shades uh, in the operatory. So a lot of people like these bleach shades. This particular patient, they want something lighter than a uh, really light shade here. So uh, uh, there's a new shade called TBW, toilet bowl white. So, <laughs> I hate, I hate to show this photo, but it's funny. But some people want such white shades that can't be achieved. You know, it's uh, it's funny because I I, it's funny. I did a, a surgical guide a few years ago, right? And you know how we use that radio peg material for surgical guide sometimes? It's really that white, white. Well, we made a denture with denture teeth out of these for the, uh, with a surgical guide. And the patient wanted that shade in their final teeth, the final restorations. I said, it's impossible to do that. And, but they wanted to wear that surgical guide with the denture. And it was an upper denture we made with, uh, with these radio peg teeth. And I'd never heard that before in my life, but this is uh, the extreme some patients go through with white, white shades. So uh, that's, that's why I like to show that funny picture there. But, uh, so let's look at other influencing factors. Dehydration, lipstick, bright clothing, patient's complexion or eye color. And we have to really try to meet the patient's expectations when we're taking 
taking the shade. When do we select a shade? Before the rubber dam application, two weeks after the completion of a bleaching treatment, after the tooth or teeth have been polished, and before preparation. We have our armatarium as a shade guide. I put down blue paper, I'll tell you what that's about in a minute, a hand mirror and a detailed lab script. And uh, you know, when it comes to lab scripts and in dental laboratory, you know, we need more, especially on uh, highly aesthetic anterior restorations, we need more than just say, saying number eight, A2. We need something uh, more of a breakdown of the shade from the cervical to the mid, mid section of its tooth and all, all the way to the incisal edge. And many times we'll get three different shades on an anterior restoration. So what do we need to blue paper? I mentioned earlier, well, our eyes adapt to their surroundings in, in color and light levels. And the oral cavity is an additional contrast of colors and light levels. So the cones become depleted of the pigments for yellow and orange. And so more sensitive to the complementary color, uh, which is blue. So that's why we stare at the blue paper for a little while. And it brings us back to the stage where we can actually take an accurate shade. Really important. And we need to cleanse the memory periodically while we're selecting the shade Without cleansing, you'll have difficulty perceiving true color. We talked about staring at a, at a tooth and uh, in in the cone, de cone depletion that we talked earlier about earlier. We wanna make sure we have to, we, you know, we cleanse our memory of that, that shade so we can take a more accurate shade. So it's about 30 to 40 seconds that you're gonna be staring at the, uh, the blue paper. And you can use any blue surface as a patient bib, a wall or a piece of paper, uh, all, that, all that works when you look at those. So. And a hand mirror for interior restorations, always have the patient approve the shade. If the patient's not happy, then nobody is happy with the shade selection. And a detailed lab script, like I mentioned earlier, the complicated shade matches. Let's you know, write out a diagram of the tooth or the teeth would in, in, in indicate variations of the shade. You might have a decalcification mark or just different uh, points on the tooth that we want to match uh, to the opposing tooth uh, or the adjacent tooth. And a single shade is often not enough. So in stump shades, you want to make, always take a shade of the preparation when prescribing an all ceramic restoration. You know, dark color prep will have a direct effect on the final shade of the restoration and it must be compensated for in a laboratory. So all ceramic restorations, you know, we talk about the translucent restorations and we need that stump shade and describe any staining or discoloration on a preparation. And because we'll have to mask that in the final restoration. Okay, let's talk about shade taking procedures here. So if you if you narrow down your shade selection to two shades, I'll get, I'll get to this slide in a second here, but select the lighter of the two when you're doing that. If you're going for two shades, look, look at the lighter one. It's much e easier to increase the chroma and lower the value of a restoration than it is to make it lighter or brighter. So don't stare at the shade for more than five to 10 seconds and because the longer you stare, like I mentioned, the more similar the shades will appear. And to help readjust your eyes for yellow, and orange, just look at the blue paper like I mentioned earlier. Remember that single central incisor is the most difficult shade to match, you know, and advise the patient of this as well, because these restorations some, sometimes require additional adjustments and should be taken into consideration in the event that the patient needs a restoration by a certain time or a specific date. But these patients should be in an upright position and the patient, uh, the position of the shade tab in the same position of the tooth, the max layer or mandibular, mandibular like I showed you before. Same position as the tooth being measured. Always view the shade from the both direct and, and, and slight through indirect viewpoints. And then always take the shade before prepping the tooth and verify the shade after prepping. Only if the adjacent teeth have been kept completely, completely hydrated during prepping. So allow the patient to review your choice in an upright position. Make sure they hold the mirror at arm's length from their face. This also applies when the patient is evaluating restoration and delivery. Holding the mirror at arm's length also allows for the proper amount of light to enter the mouth. The shade which should be selected, like I mentioned before, prior to the, uh, the rubber dam or preparation of the tooth, and the tooth to, uh, to be matched should be polished along with the surrounding dentition. If you don't have color corrected lights, walk your patient over to the window uh, for natural sunlight, uh, for the natural, most natural light source. source. So um, and this is where we have in most, a lot of our laboratories, we have the operatory chair near, near, near our window uh, and we have that natural light source. It's not practical, keep your patient seated, but turn off the chair light. Have the patient run their tongue over the teeth and to be examined. So we talked about this, so I just wanna review, we have a value. Which is, which is the, uh, uh, the darkness and brightness of a, of a tooth. And as you saw that sphere at the beginning of the presentation, we had a, a U and chroma. Now we just have our value right here, light and dark. 
So sometimes you can, when, you, when you squint, it limits the amount of light perceived by your eyes and aids in determining the, the, the value uh, of the tooth. So try squinting if you really need to, uh, to uh, perceive that a little bit differently as far as value goes. And we have a description of color of a U, like I mentioned earlier, and chroma. I just like to bring this up a lot just to correlate with what I'm talking about here. So, and don't stare at the tooth. So let's talk about the 3D uh, tooth guide, 3D master tooth guide. We're going to talk about one approach here, and then we're going to talk about a simplified approach. So we talked about earlier, the first thing we want to do is determine the lightness or, or, or the lightness level or the value. So we're going to hold that shade guide to the patient's mouth at arm's length. <clears throat> Look at the figure on the right. Select group one, two, three, four, or five, and that's going to be your value group. So out of those groups, start the selection with the, with the darkest group and move to the light. So we're going to go from five to one on there. So say it was uh, we had, uh, section three. Now we're gonna take that section three and select the chroma. So on the basis of lightness, determine, uh, take the middle group out and determine the chroma and spread them out like a fan. So that middle group is gonna be for your chroma and select one of the three, the th one of the three closest samples that uh, matches the tooth. And number three is determining the U and that's from the uh, uh, left, middle and the right and check whether the natural tooth is more reddish or more yellowish than the shade sample so, so selected. So we're gonna go from le uh, left, middle, or right. So you'll, that's how you get your 3D shade. That's what we're gonna determine, determine our U value and chroma. But this is a simpler method to do this too. So, uh, but value is found usually in a, in a three group, more than 50% of the test patients. That's why I showed that on the screen here. So start with the lightest, most diluted chroma and add intensity. And U is found in the M group, more than 50% of test patients, and a U shift to red or yellow is, is not mandatory. So. There's the alternative approach. You can remove all the left and right U tabs and it'll be a little simpler to take the shade. And the value group is easily determined by doing this. So let's talk about a simpler approach, approach the, uh, the linear shade guide, three meeting master shade guide. And then instead of a three-step process, it's a two-step process. And a lot of the universities are teaching this. They have these at many of the universities and dental schools across the country. It's an improved faster shade uh, selection process. And I'll show you how we do this. So first thing with this is the linear shade guide, as you can see here, it's a nice little case to, uh, and it's broken up, broken up into value. And so we take that five uh, group value uh, block out of the uh, uh, linear shade guide and we pick the uh, value. Once we pick, pick the value, we go to that, for instance, this is that two shade, uh, two, two uh, section, which we saw that it was in the two, uh, two, uh, um, the two value right here, two M2. And then we're going, to, we're going to select the chroma and U with this one, one shade tab with the, with the, uh, you know, with the seven tabs on here. And we're going to select. So it's a two process, uh, uh, shade process taking uh, solution as opposed to three. It makes life a lot easier. So really simple. Select the value, select your chroma and U, and there you got it. So it's a great, great procedure. And you know, once the selection has been made, confirm it with another team member. And then we have to confirm everything on the lab script. So with that, we're going to move into some of the electronic shade taking techniques here. And uh, before we get started on this, I want to I want to just uh, bring up the, the, the last polling question and see who's using electronic shade taking techniques. If you are utilizing an electronic shade taking system, which one have you had the most success with? Colorometers, spectrophotometers, intraoral scanners, or digital cameras? And remember, I mentioned before, spectrophotometers are the, are the, the electronic shade taking systems where you don't you don't need light. If you utilize an electric shade taking system, which one have you had the most success with? Colorometers, spectrophotometers, intraoral scanners, or digital cameras? All right, digital cameras. Okay, good. Yeah. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Digital cameras. It's great. Thank you. So we have three different kinds we're going to talk about right now. Colorometer, spectrophotometer, and spectrophotometer, and intraoral scanners. And we're going to talk about actual uh, digital cameras. So we were talking about electronic shade determination. We talked earlier about the, you know, Munsell is you, and he set the stage for color applications in many different industries. So these color applications apply with paint, textiles, printing, photography, plastics, and so many industries across, you know, across around the world. And uh, so they have these electronic shade taking systems also. And also with paints too, you know, we talked about, uh, I mentioned paints, you know, we, I've, I've been to different uh, paint stores, but they use uh, like a spectrophotometer to actually measure the shade. So a colorometer, it works like the human eye. It has three sensors. We talked about RGB before, red, green, and blue. And all the other color mixes are the primary colors. 
And then the spectrum photometer, it measures with spectral reflectance. We don't need a light and, and it has a wavelength specific and sees the entire visible spectrum and no light source is dependent. So if you heard of the easy shade, that's what, that's a spectral photometer. You know, so, uh, and I used to use the easy shade a lot for verifying shades in the laboratory uh, when we were doing quality control, but there, there's, there's been, you know, good and bad feedback on the easy shade. And the reason why there's bad feedback is you have to really calibrate these with what, what, when you, before you use them, and you have to update the software on these types of, uh, these types of shade guidance systems. So it's advanced technology. And what we do here is we, we place the, uh, the easy shade right on the tooth and It'll give you shades and classic shades and V to and, and V to 3D shades, 3D master shades also. And normally you would take on three sections of the tooth, the cervical, the midsection, and towards the incisal edge. So it's a spectrophotometer with multiple miniature spectrophotometers in it. So that's how you get that accuracy with the different shades. And regardless of lighting conditions, it's a self-sufficient device that offers shade results in seconds. So, um, and you know, I hear, Good and bad with everything, but I think it's it's really how the know-how or how to use these particular electronic shade taking systems. And it has a pretty good um, uh, display screen, and you can transfer this over to the software on the computer, and it maps out the tooth also with different shades of different sections of the tooth, and it makes it kind of easy for us at the laboratory to to, uh, to layer porcelain. And then you have your intraoral scanners. You know, it's a, that's a texture-based shade matching system. You know, and it's, they call it a BRDF12 process, and it elects a single preferred geometry obtained from this, the, the scan data set. And it processes all the data directly from tooth surfaces, and it factors in all angles and changes in, in, uh, in uh, intensity and direction. And, you know, I, again, I'm here good and bad with these also, you know, but I like to, you know, I, 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 the good, the good um, feedback I get are the people who have been using it for a while and really learn how to do these uh, shades correctly with these intro oil scanners. So, and one of the most popular ones and, and relevant ones and works correctly is it's a cast stream one. So instead of determining a shade from a single RBG value, the smart shade technology that cast stream has, they use a biodirectional reflectance distribution function, which is BRDF and it provides a true, uh, more true to life match. So here you can see, this is one of the screen uh, shots from the uh, uh, cast stream uh, shade guide system. And this is taking the stump shade, but that seems to work out well. And they have, they, they, they just came out with a new system, also CareStream, which is a, a, a digital shade taking system, electronic shade taking system that works, works really well. And then you have three shape trios. This is another you know, part of the intro all scanning uh, uh, series, and that, that that works well also. And there's digital photography, and I hear more and more saying people saying they use digital photography. And you know, over the years, we've gotten a lot of digital photography in the, in the laboratory when shades were taken. But you know, it's the color is significantly impacted by the light source. So there's still a subjective component when comparing the cap, uh, captured digital images on on these types of shades. You want to make sure the light source is, is correct. So um, and they use a sand, standard RGB or red, green, and blue color model, uh, which has some limitations. So then there's something new out on, on a market called ShadeWave. ShadeWave, it's great. I mean, we've been starting to use this at DSG and it's computerized shade determination using your iPhone. And it has software that we uh, load on the iPhone and it has software program on your computer. And I'll show you how it's done. And then only using two, two shade tabs for references. So, and um, it integrates and automates iPhone photography with, with ShadeWave uh, mobile, it's called. And so, Here's the, here's the iPhone. It takes voice commands. You don't have to worry about pressing or anything. So once you load the software in here and, and you, you hold it to the, uh, the patient's mouth, all you use, you use the same two shade tabs all the time. It's only used as a reference. And the self software determines the correct sh uh, shades by looking at the patient's mouth and the patient's teeth and the reference, reference points on the shade guide. And it's very accurate. And I, I tell you, it's, it's, you can take a shade, you tell your iPhone, to take a shade, automatically goes to your software on your computer, and then it, you can send it right to us at the laboratory to evaluate that shade. And it has color mapping also. So it's only using shade A2 and D3 uh, as a shade tab re reference. And we directly transfer it to the lab in real time from the dental office. Two mouse clicks, and then uh, it, it gives you all of the shades. When you get on the software, you click twice on the shade, and the shade will come up on the software with the correct, uh, correct shade. And, uh, and you'll have mapping across the restoration with different kinds of shades also. Okay, so this, yeah, this, so this, this, this is one of the newest technologies out there. It's been working out really well. And 
it's, you know, you can see the mapping on here. So we, we have different shades. There's D2 in there, the cervical, A2 in the middle of the section, and A1 and uh, bleaching shade towards the middle. So we have all the shades we need to build up a proper restoration. So some great technology out there. You know, usually when I do this course, it's about a three to six hour course, and we get to use and, use and play with some of this technology, but we're doing this virtual. So I, I try to squeeze everything in here today with, the, uh, with all this information. So uh, you know, I hope you got a lot out of it here. So, uh, you know, so here's the in, in uh, www.shadewave.com if you want you know, some more information on that uh, type of uh, uh, system. So in conclusion, shade matching of dental restorative materials with natural teeth is vital to producing restorations that are natural looking. Patients expect the clinician to restore missing and broken teeth to an acceptable aesthetic appearance. And a better understanding of the physical and physiological processes involved in human color vision, color theory, and shade science should enhance an appreciation for the challenges associated with the two shades uh, selection. So with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. I want to thank everybody for being with us tonight. I really appreciate it. I know it's a lot of information to one hour. I kind of go fast, but I like to squeeze everything in from the basics to the advanced. So uh, I hope this helped you with your shade taking technology in your dental offices. Thank you, Dennis, for the plethora of information. Oh, thank you. Came unplugged. Sorry if you couldn't hear me really that well. I have questions. One is what what shade of blue paper? Oh, I, I would do like a blue, like a, not a dark blue, just a little, maybe like a, uh, a little lighter than navy blue. You don't want something that's too dark. Yeah. And not something that's too light. <laughs> yeah, yeah. nothing's too light either. Um, not, not like my background. My background tonight is like a light blue that's too light. <clears throat> but you want some, maybe something- Maybe like the question mark? Something like the DSG logo on top of your screen there, the, little light, the lighter part of it. That's nice. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's it. And the question mark, go. yeah, the question mark is great. That's perfect. Yeah, if it's too too um, too dark, uh, they they said it's not cleansing your the memory of the of the your eye uh, like it should. So a little lighter, oh, rather great. a little lighter than darker. Thank you, Dennis. And then we have is including photos of the patient in various light settings helpful. What are the best angles? Yes, I mean, right head on is the best angle. You have that light straight on from the patient. That's, that's going to be the best angle for the shade taking system, uh, for taking an uh, accurate shade, rather. Um, and, um, you know, otherwise, it's going to, like you saw those different restorations I saw, those that I showed you earlier, they had different angulations on them, you know. So the light source directly at the patient really helps us uh, with the uh, correct lighting, correct shade. So uh, with different angles, I think that's going to confuse things. I try to be consistent with uh, one, one or two angles, maybe, you know, maybe to the left, to the right, and maybe in the middle. But uh, the, the head-on uh, light source, right onto the denture, onto uh, the uh, tooth, is what we we don't normally use. So if they have their camera in front of them, do they want the light behind them? Yeah, and then yeah, they're in yeah. front of the patient. Well, if they have if they have a light uh, correct light on your camera, that's great too. You know, so but yeah, I would say right behind you, looking down onto the patient. You know, so. Uh, and that's perfect. Perfect. And then yep. how to pick the shade with people who have white spots on their teeth, or they call it molting, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, yeah, it's molting and uh, we decalcification marks and things like that. Just try to get the best uh, shade of the body of the tooth that you can, uh, because it's, that's hard to break it up. And just let us know where that, um, you know, that molting is. And sometimes we can't see it and let us know. If, a lot of patients want to mimic that on the natural dentition, on the restoration rather, when we make it. Uh, so we've put, we'll add some of these decalcification marks, especially when you have like number eight and nine, and number nine has those marks, uh, decalcification, or a little bit of molting. Uh, but yeah, trying to get us a, a, a good shade with the body of the tooth first, and then we can work from there. Great. And does digital camera reflect the same color as the shade? That's difficult. That's that's a good question. Yeah, that's why I mentioned earlier we've had I've had some problems in the past with the digital photography with the incorrect lighting. You know, so um, so you want to make sure that the correct lighting is a little bit behind you, or with, you have that correct lighting on your camera when you're taking the shade, um, and not too much reflectiveness on it. You know, so uh, you might want to put a filter on there also when you take that uh, take that shade, because I've had you know. A, A3, A, A, A3.5 look like an A1 at times, you know, and, uh, and it's important when you, and hold that shade tab against the tooth. And please, we get this like 30 to 40% of the time, 
Uh, we got a shade tab, but they're taking a picture with the shade tab next to the tooth and they're covering the number of the shade tab. So make sure you expose that A1, A2, whatever number's on that shade tab and when you send it in. So, uh, and that's why I kind of like, you know, especially with the um, electronic shade taking systems, it really breaks down and gives you the mapping of the tooth. You know, we don't want too much information, but it'll drive us crazy. We can't possibly build up a tooth with, you know, a hundred different shades, you know, but we have those three, three or four shades that we need to build up a good aesthetic restoration. That's great. And either you can write it down on the RX or if you're using the electronic shade taking system, uh, we love that color mapping on there. That really helps us out a lot. Wonderful. Isn't it amazing how far technology has come? Oh, it's great. Yeah. And I love that new shade wave that works out really well. I believe me, I was so skeptical when I saw that. And now being in a dental office and, and watching them use that and uh, have their real time shade coming to us at the laboratory instantly, it's amazing. You know, it really works well. And that's also, we have to have proper lighting for that too. It's not perfect. We really have to have proper lighting with that, uh, that technology also. Thank you for the tip. Yep. And what type of ceiling light do you recommend in the operatory room? They have the, uh, the D50 illuminance now. Uh, this because there's uh, a number of different quality uh, companies selling the natural natural lights. It's, it's more to get the closest thing to natural uh, outdoor light and you're, you're good. So, so a lot of these companies selling these color corrective lights. Uh, just ask them for the color corrective light that's going to be closest to outdoor lighting. You know, so that's why I used to have that in a laboratory. They were expensive, but uh, they worked, you know, and uh, you don't want to get that, that tint uh, coming off a, a fluorescent light, you know, so uh, that's, you know, what that's going to, that's going to really give you an inaccurate shade. Wonderful. Thank you. And so for our last question, how well does the computerized shade taking systems work if the patient has six anterior crowns or veneers? Yeah, well, it, it doesn't work that great when you have a, 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 a composite veneer or an acrylic veneer. Uh, if it's a porcelain restoration, it'll, it'll work, you know, because what's happening, you know, um, it, when you would say, with, like, a, lot of, a lot of times when when, we, when I was showing this uh, spectrophotometer, spectrophotometer shade taking system, uh, it would go against an, uh, an acrylic shade tab and it doesn't penetrate that. It just re reflects back. So we want something that's where uh, the light uh, uh, is going to uh, penetrate. So that's like an, a, a porcelain restoration, uh, and not you don't want a composite, or you don't want you don't want a, um, an acrylic restoration because you're not going to get an accurate shade. But if you know if you have the correct you know system, the software is up to date, it's calibrated, uh, you should have success with these systems. Wonderful, Dennis. Thank you so much for your expertise in this area. You're I'm not so. Oh. Uh, we've getting thank yous and awesome presentation. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, audience, we do appreciate you learning with us this evening. We did post up our recommended next webinar, Three Shape Trios, Implant Planning and Restorations Made Easy. It's being presented by their academy team, Dr. Angeles. So we hope you join, or Hermie for short, we hope you join us with uh, Dr. Hermie there. Uh, we got a very f informative for you, Dennis. Nice, nice. <laughs> I forgot. I had the wrong. I had the wrong last slide up here. That was a previous slide from the, the uh, uh, presentation I did with the residents a few, few weeks ago. But if you want to get a hold of me, you can reach me at durban at dentalservices.net. So uh, I'm sorry for that. I had the wrong information up there. Oh, no worries. And I do have it posted earlier in the chat box. Dennis Great. does hand out his cell, which is nine one four six six four. Oh, I only no. have it as 220. I cut off a number. My no, apologies, I'll give you my, audience. I'll give you the cell. It's 347-498-4521. It's 347-498-4521. And um, my email address is durban at dentalservices.net. It's, it's the one on top there. So. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, audience, for being with us. We look forward to learning with you again in the future. And now, oh, wait, one more Q&A. Oh, yeah. a thank you. <laughs> it was a thank you. Oh, thank um, you. I really appreciate everybody being with us tonight. It really means a lot. You know, it's something I love to do. I've, you know, I've been at this for many years and I got to travel around the world and uh, it's uh, it, 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 lecturing and learning. And it's such a pleasure and honor for me to do this uh, and present to you all, all tonight. Appreciate it. And it shows, Dennis. So now I get to turn it over to you to close in your positively positive way. Uh, thank you, Jessica. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. We hope you all had a positive learning experience tonight. May you apply your knowledge and expertise in, in a positive way, in a way that will enhance your careers and self-worth. So have a great day. Stay safe and hope to see you soon.
Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night.